Hey you guys, this is Mr. Millings and today we're going to learn about the different element classes on the periodic table. Now if you remember from an earlier video, we learned a little bit about the periodic table of elements and we said that everything to the left of that stair step line with the exception of hydrogen is going to be a metal and everything to the right of that stair step line is going to be a non-metal and anything that lies directly on the stair step line with the exception of aluminum and a couple others is going to be a semi-metal or a metalloid. So today what we're going to do is we're just going to talk a little bit about the physical and chemical properties of metals and nonmetals and metalloids and then we're going to talk a little bit about alkali metals the alkaline earth metals and several other groups on the periodic table of elements so let's go ahead and talk about metals first it says right here that some physical properties of metals are uh, that they're typically uh, hard shiny malleable they're ductile and have good electric and thermal co conductivity all right, so metals are malleable. What does that mean? Well, that means that they can be hammered into thin sheets, kind of like aluminum or gold. We know that metals are good conductors of heat, and they're also good conductors of electricity, right? We also know that metals tend to be ductile. What does that mean? Well, we can turn copper, which is a metal, into wire. So ductility means that you can make wires out of them. Uh, let's see, most of these guys are going to be solid at room temperature. In fact, all of them, with the exception of, uh, of, of mercury, are solids at room temperature. Mercury is a liquid at room temperature. And metals typically have a high density. All right, so there are some properties of metals. And if we take a look over here, we have some metal examples. Here's some gold. Here's some mercury that's in the liquid stage or state at room temperature. Here are a few chunks of sodium. And uh, here is some calcium right here. Okay, so some physical properties of metals right here and some examples. Let's take a look at nonmetals now. All right, nonmetals. It says nonmetals are elements that are that uh, that mostly lack metallic in attributes. Okay, these guys physically uh, tend to be brittle, dull, have low elasticity, and are good conductors of heat and electricity. And if you're a good conductor of heat and electricity, that makes you. I'm sorry. Uh, if you're a, a poor conductor of heat and electricity, that's going to make you a good insulator of heat and electricity. So nonmetals tend to be good insulators, whereas metals tend to be good conductors of heat and electricity. All right, so some examples, some physical characteristics or properties of nonmetals. They tend to be brittle. They're poor conductors of heat, which makes them good insulators. They're dull, meaning they're not shiny. These guys typically have low densities. They're poor conductors of electricity. And it says right here that half of them are solid and half of these guys are going to be gas at room temperature. So examples of some nonmetals here, we have some chlorine gas, uh, this, um, this pale yellowish green gas is a, an example of a, a nonmetal. The sulfur that we see right here is a, is a nonmetal. The carbon right here or soot that we see right here is a nonmetal. And then the phosphorus that we see right here is a nonmetal. So these guys have a tendency to be brittle. They're dull. They're not shiny. They're good uh, insulators, uh, which makes them poor conductors of heat and electricity. All right, let's take a look at some metalloids or semi-metals next. All right, if we take a look right here, metalloids or semi-metals are elements whose properties are similar to both of those of metals and solid nonmetals. Okay, these guys are electrical semiconductors. And so metalloids, these can be found directly on the stair step line, with the exception of a couple of them, like aluminum. So these guys make good uh, semiconductors. These guys can be shiny or dull. These guys have typically low densities. These guys, electronegativity values, we'll talk about what this means later on, but know that the electronegativity values are somewhere between metals and nonmetals. These guys also possess characteristics of both metals and nonmetals. And these guys also have ionization energies between metals and nonmetals and we'll talk about what ionization energy means in a different or later video so examples of some metalloids or semi-metals uh, the silicon right here the germanium right here the boron right here and last but not least if we take a look at this arsenic right here that is going to be another example of a metalloid so now let's take a look at the different element classes and uh, see some of their physical and chemical properties all right let's talk about the alkali metals the alkali metals are all the metals that are in group one on the periodic table so if we take a look at group one and we exclude hydrogen everything from lithium down to francium is going to be an alkali metal alkali metals are all the elements in group one on the periodic table 
with the exception of hydrogen. So what are some physical and chemical properties of the alkali metals? Well, these guys are highly reactive in water. If you throw them in water, they get more, uh, they're more highly reactive as you go down the group. For example, if you throw in a small chunk of lithium into water, it's going to fizz a little bit, maybe ignite. However, if you throw some uh, potassium, that's going to be a more violent reaction. And francium would be even more violent than, than, uh, than potassium. So they're highly reactive in water. These guys also have one valence electron. What is a valence electron? Those are all the electrons in the outermost energy level. So these guys all have one valence electron. And because these are so reactive with water, they're never found alone in nature. Right? You'll never just see sodium all by itself in nature. If it's not reacting with another element on the periodic table, it's going to react with the water that's in the, uh, the soil or in the water vapor, vapor that's in the, uh, the atmosphere. These guys typically uh, have low densities. These guys become more reactive as you move down the group like we just talked about. These guys have low boiling points compared to the other metals that we're going to talk about. And these guys are also very soft. In fact, you can actually cut little pieces of sodium off with a knife, a butter knife for that matter. And same with potassium and lithium. And these guys have low melting points compared to other metals. All right, so these are the, uh, these are the alkali metals. We have lithium, we have sodium, we have rubidium. We have uh, some potassium as well. Okay, so these are the alkali metals, all the elements in group one on the periodic table. All right, next up, we have the alkaline earth metals. The alkaline earth metals are all the metals in group two on the periodic table. So if you look at your periodic table, everything from beryllium all the way down to radium, these guys are the alkaline earth metals. So here are some examples right here. We've got some beryllium. We have some uh, magnesium here. We have some calcium here. And we have some strontium right here. All of these are alkaline earth metals. So what does that mean about these guys? Well, here are some physical and chemical properties of the alkaline earth metals. These guys have two valence electrons, two electrons in their outermost energy level uh, available for bonding. They're, these guys are also highly reactive. These also form strong bases when they, uh, they react with water. They have low boiling points, low melting points, and these guys typically are uh, shiny and silvery white in appearance. Okay, so these are the alkaline earth metals, all of the metals in group two on the periodic table. Okay, moving across the periodic table, next we have the transition metals. The transition metals are all of the metals in groups three through 12 on the periodic table. These are all transition metals, all right? So there's a lot of them. Here we have some silver, that's gonna be a transition metal. Here we have some tungsten, another transition metal. Here we have some cobalt, another transition metal. And here we have some copper, another transition metal. So what are some of the physical and chemical properties of these? Well, when these guys react with other elements, they're typically going to form uh, colored compounds. These guys are less reactive than the alkali and alkaline earth metals. These guys are typically going to have high melting points. They have varying oxidation states, meaning they sometimes they can form positive one ions or positive two ions or even positive three or four ions and we'll talk about what that means later on but these guys have varying oxidation states these guys are good conductors of uh, electricity and they're also good conductors of heat so keep in mind that the transition metals are all of the metals in uh, in groups three through twelve on the periodic table of elements all right, next we have the halogens. The halogens are all of the elements in group 17 on the periodic table. And what does the word halogen mean? Well, it means salt producing. So typically when these react with metals, they're going to produce some sort of salt. Okay, that's why they're called halogens, salt producers. All right, so some examples of some halogens in group 17 on the periodic table. We have fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and acetine. All of these, uh, these non-metals in group 17 are going to be halogens. So here's some chlorine gas for you, pale yellowish green gas. We have uh, some bromine right here. We have some liquefied uh, fluorine right here, this yellowish uh, substance right here. And we have some iodine tablets right here. Okay, so these are uh, some examples of some halogens. And so some physical and chemical properties of these guys is that all of these here have seven valence electrons. They have seven electrons in their outermost energy level. These guys typically form diatomic molecules. What does that mean? Well, that means if these guys are not bonded to another atom on the periodic table, they will always be bonded to themselves. 
They're, you're never just going to see one fluorine or one chlorine or one bromine atom in nature. If they are not bonded to another atom on the periodic table, they will always be bonded to themselves. They form diatomic molecules. These guys are also highly reactive. These guys are never found alone in nature like we just talked about. These guys form salts when bonded with a metal, and these guys act as oxid oxidizing agents. What does that mean? Well, they have a tendency to strip electrons off other elements on the periodic table specifically metals. All right, so those are the halogens. Let's take a look at the next class of elements. All right, next up we have the noble gases. So what are, are the noble gases? Well, all of the elements in group 18 on the periodic table are the noble gases. And typically we're going to say that these guys are inert. They're chemically unreactive. However, there are some instances where they will react with other elements. But for the most part, they're chemically inert. They're stable. Okay, so all of the elements in group 18 on the periodic table are going to be your noble gases. Helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, and radon. These guys are all chemically stable. These guys are typically colorless. They're odorless. They're monatomic. What does that mean? Well, they exist by themselves. For example, it's possible for there to be just one helium atom uh, hanging out somewhere or a neon atom not bonded to itself or another atom. They're monatomic, meaning one. All right, these guys have a completely uh, filled outer energy level. That is why they're unreactive, and we'll talk about that in a later video. And these guys are very have very low chemical reactivity. They're inert, right? They're very, 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 very rarely will react with other atoms. So we say that they're chemically inert. So if we take a look at some examples over here, we have helium under high voltage. We said that they're color, colorless over here. But if we pass some electric current through them, what we can see are the electrons going from uh, higher energy levels to lower energy levels and emitting uh, energy in the form of light along the way. And the light that's emitted corresponds to a certain amount of energy. So helium, as we see here, is emitting some relatively low, uh, low frequency, low energy light right here. Here's some neon under some high voltage right here. We have some krypton under some high voltage right here. And we have some argon under some high voltage here, right? So if you've ever seen a neon sign, that's going to be the same principle, right? You have a bunch of neon gas in those tubes. And uh, when you pass an electric current through there, you're going to get this, this nice pretty red neon sign. Okay, so those are the noble gases. Let's take a look at a couple more. All right, next up we have the lanthanides. So if you take a look at the lanthanides here, the lanthanides are uh, uh, all the elements from 57 to 70 to 71 on the periodic table. And this is where some confusion may lie. Some periodic tables have the lanthanides going to 70. Some of them have them going to 71. So pay attention to that. All right, so oftentimes these guys are going to be referred to as the rare earth elements. So all these right here are the lanthanides or rare earth elements. Elements like cerium, these are all going to be metals because they're found to the left of the stair step line. We have some holmium here, we have some thulium here, and we have some erbium right here. These are all the lanthanides or rare earth elements. And so these guys have a tendency to be silvery white. They tarnish in air. Uh, the atomic radius decreases as you move from left to right. Uh, across the row here. These guys typically have high melting points, high boiling points, and last but not least, these guys are going to be very reactive. So those are the lanthanides down at the bottom of the periodic table. Last, we have the actinides. The actinides are all of the elements from about 89 to 102, 103 on the periodic table. So the very bottom of the periodic table, you're going to find the actinides or the actinide series from 89 all the way to 102 or so. And so some examples are going to be uranium, Here's a chunk of uranium. We have plutonium right here. We have mendelevium. Mendelevium. This is named after uh, the founder of the periodic table, Dmitry Mendeleev. He actually has a, an element named after him uh, in his honor. Element 101 is mendelevium. And then we have some neptunium right here. Okay. So once you get to the actinides and lanthanides, you're going to notice that some of these are in parentheses. Some of the mass numbers or average atomic masses are in are in parentheses and what that's going to mean is that these are man-made these are synthetic these are made in laboratories they do not exist uh, in nature okay so that's what that means these are all synthetic einsteinium fermium named after famous scientists nobelium named after alfred nobel and so some properties of these right here they tarnish in air these guys have a tendency to be radioactive that means that their nucleus over time the mass of their nucleus 
uh, becomes smaller and smaller over time as it gets turned into energy in accordance to uh, Einstein's e equals mc squared. These guys have a tendency to be highly electropositive, very dense, uh, a lot of different allotropes formed with these, and these guys have a tendency to react with boiling water to produce hydrogen gas. All right, so those are the actinides. All right, so here are some of the attributions that made these videos, uh, this video possible. All the pictures of the different elements and uh, and uh, the attributions. Here you go. You can go ahead and pause this and take a look. Uh, but this is basically where I got all the pictures of the different elements that made this video possible. Let's take a look. All right, so if you like what you see, go ahead and click the little bomb in the bottom right-hand corner, and feel free to leave any comments in the comment section down below, and I hope you found this helpful.